Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the outstanding pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am okay, Brian. It is Preakness Week already. Jewel two of the Triple Crown. Yeah, the second leg of the Triple Crown, Matt. It, it, it almost doesn't feel like the second leg of the Triple Crown in that only one Kentucky Derby horse is running back in Saturday's Preakness. The good news is it is the Kentucky Derby winner himself, Mage. Let's look at that field, Matt. We got eight horses. Um, Mage... Mage is the horse to beat. He's the Derby winner. He was a deserving Kentucky Derby winner. He's made four lifetime starts. He's getting better with every start. On the other hand, I don't think he's a sure thing here against seven. Let's, oh, let's do it one more year. Let's call him seven new shooters. <laughs> yeah, new shooters. Go ahead with that, uh, Brian. Yeah, and it's been a long time since... Uh, there's only been one horse from the Kentucky Derby uh, uh, go into the Preakness. I was it. I saw 1960 something. I know it hasn't happened this century. Uh, as Mays tries to become the eighth horse since the year 2000 to win the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness and move on. Yeah, Mays is the story, Matt. But let's talk just a little bit about the spacing between the races. I've said in years past, and. I, I was lambasted for it a little bit. I don't mind being lambasted. That's part of my job. But I was lambasted a little bit saying, don't mess with tradition. Don't make it easier for a horse to win the Triple Crown. I don't really believe in either of those things. I just think the Preakness has weakened a lot in recent years by, by, by connections not wanting to run back after two weeks, after a tough race in the Kentucky Derby. Is it time we look to space these races out a little bit more? Well, you know, Brian, the, 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 the other point that's important to make in that discussion is that uh, horses going from the Kentucky Derby to the Preakness, and this is in my own study of that since the year 2000, hold a tremendous advantage um, in the Preakness, the horses that are come that come back on that two week notice, and obviously their connections have said, "Okay, my horse is ready. I, I don't have any reason why I can't go in two weeks." Those horses have outperformed the new shooters significantly. Although in the last the last few years, it's been a little bit more towards the the new shooters and i think we'll talk about that a little bit more as we look at the field yeah matt i i appreciate you looking back over the last quarter century or so but i think this is all a more recent trend where less and less derby horses are running back last year's derby winner didn't even start in the preakness so if you look at recent trends we see cloud computing we see early voting as horses for chad brown who skipped the derby waited for the preakness a much shorter field in the preakness and they won it so I don't know. I, I, I've said for years, I think we need a bigger gap between these races. I think it's just best for the Preakness. I think it's best for the Triple Crown. And in the long run, I don't think it would make it easier for a horse to win the Triple Crown. Maybe this is easier for Mage to beat this field on Saturday, uh, going against seven horses who were not in the Kentucky Derby. May, may I, I come back to this, Matt. Mage was um, certainly... Uh, full of potential in three races at Gulfstream Park. He finished four, uh, uh, a nice debut winner in a sprint. He was uh, troubled fourth. He had some trouble in the Fountain of Youth when he was fourth behind 4K. I thought he ran a big race in the Florida Derby when he was second. And he keeps getting better. Last time he won the Kentucky Derby. If he runs back to his Derby performance, Matt, I think he wins this. If he runs back to his Florida Derby performance, I think he probably wins this. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brian. I mean, this is not a particularly strong field. And, and I guess you could say, well, you know, in the in the Kentucky Derby, he had everything his way. And, and in a sense, he did. He had a hot pace to close into. Javier Castellano gave Mage you know, an absolutely perfect, patient 
ride. And in that comment, that means that they did not run into any traffic. Um, things went well. Um, and you have to assume that in this small field of only eight, that he should be able to have another really good trip. Yeah, you would think so. You're right. Javier Castellano gave him a beautiful ride in the Kentucky Derby and the pace, the fast pace did set it up. I put up the time form U.S. pace projector here, Matt, to take a look at it. We're not expecting near the fractions that we saw in the Kentucky Derby, but there are some speed horses in here. Uh, Coffee with Chris uh, is a, a later addition to the field we didn't know about last week, but he's a nice Maryland horse, a local horse who shows speed every time, runs in stakes races every time. So him, along with horses we expected to be out there who are good horses, not necessarily speed balls, but good horses with good tactical speed in National Treasure on the rail and first mission on the outside, there should be at least a fair, reasonable pace here in the Preakness. Yeah, I, absolutely, Brian. And, and you know, the, with the smaller field and, and, and such, there isn't that factor of needing to rush out of the gate to get really good position. And as you mentioned, uh, these horses that are project, projected to be out front, are they are not speed balls by any means. They, they have some tactical speed and most likely will use it. Yeah, most likely we'll, we'll use it, and we could see three horses, just as the time form U.S. pace projector shows out there contesting the pace, but a, but a more moderate pace than the Kentucky Derby. You also may, you saw Mage closer, more in the middle of a pack this time than falling as far back as he did in the Kentucky Derby, and I think that makes sense with the slower pace. Um, if we look at the morning line here, we clearly see a, a second choice on the far outside. That's first mission. Just like Mage, Matt, he's he, he's coming into a classic with only three career starts. Mage did it successfully in the Kentucky Derby. Now, first mission will look to do it successfully coming in with only three starts, two wins, three very good performances, coming off a game win last time, moving up the rail in the Lexington. Yeah, and and like you said, two in a row for uh, for Brad Cox, the Lexington win, the maiden special weight at Fairgrounds. He uh, lost his first race, and uh, in uh, and he did that behind one of his stablemates, uh, Bishop's Bay, another nice Brad Coxworth, who just the other day uh, uh, finished second in the Peter Pan. Yeah, first mission has clearly run three good races. He's getting better by the start. He's a son of street sense. You wouldn't expect him. Uh, to uh, not go on with the longer distance, but he's never been more than a mile and 16th. He's never faced grade one horses before, so this will be a test. I think Mage had a little bit of advantage over first mission in his derby start versus first mission's Preakness start in that Mage had two tough races down in Florida with Forte against grade one quality horses, while first mission only has the grade three start in the Lexington. Uh, I, I think the one is interesting. I'm a little surprised he's four to one on the morning line, but I guess he will get bet. National Treasure. Ba Baffert's won the Preakness seven times, Matt. Uh, he's come in with a lot stronger credentials in a lot of those or most of those seven wins than National Treasure has. But on the other hand, after a first out win last summer, he's running nothing but strong races and he's always been competitive. He has been competitive, Brian. Uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, he was fourth in the Santa Anita Derby when they tried to, to get points to get into the Derby when he was running uh, for Tim Yachtin, um, third in the Sham, third in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, um, uh, ran well in all of them. I, I feel like, however, in some of those races, he wasn't facing particularly strong fields and 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 let's and, and you know let's look at the pps um hasn't found the winner's circle since that debut um back in uh, uh september yeah i'm, I'm going to disagree with you just a little bit I, I think horses like cave rock uh forte uh practical move i, I think he has faced very good horses for the most part 
He did lose a little time after the sham. The sham was his return race. He got beat a length by reincarnate. Maybe, maybe that's what you mentioned by not top, top horses. But uh, in the Santa Anita Derby, he came back after having that minor injury. And if you look at the way he finished on the stretch, he was running. So Baffert, Velasquez on the rail. I, I think you do have to fear National Treasure a little bit, even if it is for underneath in the exotics. Uh, Fort Worth on the morning line, Matt. Again, I'm not sure about the six to one odds, but you look at the connections, and that's probably the reason that Blazing Sevens is only six to one on the morning line. Chad Brown, who I mentioned with those two recent Preakness wins from horses who skipped the Derby, like Blazing Sevens did. I Rad Ortiz Jr. He hasn't won since his sloppy win at Aqueduct, which was the Grade One Champagne sloppy track, one turn. Uh, but he's also faced very good competition. Yeah, he has, uh, Brian, and and you know, I, you know, six to one seems reasonable to me. I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe even a less when you're talking about the Chad Brown factor, the Irad factor, the 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 Chad Brown move of skipping the Derby and going to the Preakness, which has been successful twice now in the last few years. Um, he's going to get bet. Um, I do have some concerns about this horse. One of them is that he hasn't won since the Champagne. Another one is that his last race was in the Bluegrass, where he finished third, a not particularly threatening third when the top two horses in the Bluegrass came back and didn't run particularly well in the Kentucky Derby. So for me, that bluegrass is not a key race by any means. There's part of me that has a feeling that maybe Blazing Sevens uh, is a one-turn horse, a one-turn mile, seven furlong horse. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, apparently, he's been training very, very well in uh, a period of time when he skipped the Derby. Yeah, you make a good point, Matt, in that the bluegrass may very well not be a key race. And when I said six to one seems a little low, all things considered, you're probably right. Six to one is probably in the neighborhood of where he'll be on the Preakness. Uh, but if you look at his form this year, that's where I say, well, six to one seems a little bit low. His fountain of youth was bad. His bluegrass was much better, but still, as you said, non-threatening third in, in, in that bluegrass. Um, yeah, I have questions about him. He's one of the three sons of good magic we haven't mentioned the sire good magic yet we need to matt because he sired mage he sired blazing sevens he also sires perform and perform to me is of the long shots i guess he's the sixth choice out of eight he's the one that's most interesting to me matt uh, he was sprinting and he was showing you know some signs of being a decent horse while losing maiden races uh, against some decent horses including Mage in one of them. But then when he stretched out, first the Tampa Bay Downs in a maiden race, and then the Federico Tessio over across town at Laurel Park performed, looked like a whole new horse for Shug McGahee. And that last race was impressive. It certainly was. That was quite a trip that Perform had uh, in the Tessio stakes. He didn't, he didn't break particularly well. And after that happened, <clears throat> He was stuck in traffic on the rail. Uh, they were waiting patiently for uh, him to get some running room. He And frankly, he was bottled up uh, uh, significantly for uh, uh, into the first turn down the, down the back stretch. And, and then uh, as they turned for harm, he, he literally was weaving his way through traffic. He was from the inside to the outside and back to the inside, weaving through the uh, through the field. And and when he finally got clear, had a really nice surge to get the win. Now, I, I could have said everything you just said with, uh, it, it was just a crazy trip. He had no business winning that Federico Tessio, and somehow he did. Uh, big step up in class, but they weren't bums that he was beating in the Federico Tessio. And for him to win with after all that trouble was just crazy and, and shows that he's really getting better. 
Uh, yeah, we see on this time form U.S. pace projector one more time. He is projected to be with Mage there in the middle of the pack. So I'm not sure he'll be quite that close, but we'll see. An improving horse, the number six, perform. Uh, another horse we need to mention, I think, is Red Route 1. He's far, far back early in all of his races, but uh, he closed like a freight train last time when he dropped down to a listed stakes at Oakland Park, which is a feeder for the Preakness. And he got up late. Red Route 1 is one of those horses who, if you don't include in your exotics, I, I think you're likely to get bit, Matt, because this is a horse who will be passing horses in the stretch. He will be passing horses in the stretch, Brian. I agree. Uh, I think we should point out that that, that, that victory uh, at Oaklawn Park recently was with first-time Lasix, and he will have to give up the medication uh um, in the Preakness, uh, when he ran in tougher races, um, he was sixth in the Arkansas Derby, second in the Rebel. Um, yeah, he'll be come. He'll be running late, passing tired horses. I agree, is a use underneath kind of horse, but historically, Brian, uh, um, deep closers don't do particularly well in the Preakness. The last deep closer to win was exaggerator uh um i don't remember if was it like around 2016 or something uh in the preakness but before that um only of only a couple of deep closers winning uh the preakness since the year 2000 yeah and 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 another point well taken that there I, I really don't like red route one to use on top but underneath underneath in the exotics i think red route one Makes a lot of sense, especially if the pace is decent here in the Preakness. All right, Matt, we're going to go from the Colts, the males, the second leg of the Triple Crown, over to the Phillies. Are you ready to switch gears? Switching. He switched, folks. That's Matt switching gears. Well done, sir. We're going to – the Phillies will have their day on Friday, the day before. And uh, there's actually a Black Eyed Susan Preakness bet if you're interested in a two-day daily double with the Phillies and the Colts. Let's take a look at that field, Matt. We got – we got more horses here in the Black Eyed Susan Friday afternoon at Pimlico. This one is nine for a long time. It looks like we have a pretty heavy favorite. She's undefeated. She comes from the barn of Bob Baffert, Matt, the daughter of Gervin, Faza, five for five out in California. Yeah, five for five, Brian, and and an and an impressive five for five in that it includes uh, her maiden special weight win and then four graded stakes races um you know clearly dominating the three-year-old philly scene out in the west and and may and and in terms of that five for five record uh, uh definitely the most impressive three-year-old philly in the country uh as of now i mean she will be asked to do some things that she hasn't done before she's gonna have to leave uh She's going to have to leave the West Coast and go and go to the East. And, you know, quite frankly, one thing in my eyes that she has in common is that even though she's five for five, she hasn't won a race in a particularly fast fashion. Yeah, well, I'm going to add on to that last point you made, Matt, because we've said this before where – uh, and, and maybe I like the Colts out in California a little bit more than you do this year. But we've said before the Colts out in California have been better than the Phillies in recent years. And I do agree that I, I do believe that that is true again this year. The Philly that she's been beating, uh, she, Faza didn't overly impress me last year, but she was winning and, and take nothing away from a horse who wins. But the horse that she's been beating up this year came to the Kentucky Oaks and I really didn't consider her and, and she wasn't part of the picture in the Kentucky Oaks. So I, I really do question, you mentioned the times, I questioned who she was beating out in California. Um, so I, I'm not ready to anoint her as the best or even one of the top couple thrill fillies in the country yet. She may be, she's five for five. She's won several stakes in a row, but uh, I want to see it as she moves cross country, as you said, as she faces a big field this time. Uh, I, I'm not sure this field is loaded with uh, with really, really strong fillies, but there are some options here. And I'm going to look at the number four, Matt, Merlaza. Uh, Brad Cox has a couple of them. And this filly, this Medaglia Doro filly, looks to be getting better and better. 
Yeah, she does, Brian. You mentioned three in a row for Brad Cox, Maiden Special Weight at Fairgrounds, Allowance at Fairgrounds, and then won a stake at Oaklawn Park, giving her uh, three in a row. Um, three in a row, always impressive. Three in a row is going to, you know, knock a price down. And I don't know, Brian, you know, uh, all it all looks impressive, but how often do we see a horse win four races in a row? Face is trying to win six, Matt. I I I don't know. Uh, are we gonna we're gonna see a Philly win six in a row? Are we gonna see a Philly win four in a row, or maybe one of the others will win? Let's take a look at the time form U.S. pace projector here, Matt. Uh, fast pace, fast pace, and and, and sadly for Malaza, and I, I'm not sure I'm going with this this time, but sadly for Malaza, she's part of that fast pace. Uh, Faza also right behind her there. They're the four and the nine, but you see six horses out on or near the lead according to the pace projector by time form us matt uh, that could set the race up for ralliers i i had a hard time finding the rallier that i really liked in here i do think the top two are the ones to beat but they are they are saying a, a pretty fast contentious pace for the uh, black eyed susan uh another horse i want to mention and and you folks know i was high on her i thought she was just an absolutely wonderful two-year-old filly who's your filly uh, really disappointed in two starts this year. I believe she was third and then fourth. Um, she's running against good Phillies, pretty mischievous, uh, being one uh, who beat her twice down there and came back and won the Kentucky Oaks. But Hoosier Philly just did not look like the same Philly uh, in two starts this year that she did last year. She gets a new track. She gets her third start of the year. Could, could Hoosier Philly pop back up? I, I guess so. And, and, you know, I find it interesting that uh, trainer Tom Amos is, uh, is got this horse ready to take another shot in a big race like the black eyed Susan. I mean, so Amos must still have some faith in her and I assume he feels like she's training well. Yeah. And, and you know, she was running against pretty mischievous and South Lawn and the alleys. Look, I, I'm not sure this race is any tougher than she was facing down there. She'll have to do better, obviously, moving to Pimlico in her third start of the year. But she was running against good horses when she was third and fourth in a couple of stakes down there. If she does wake up a little bit, I think she's dangerous. The one sacred wish, pretty lightly raced, daughter of not this time, Matt, uh, she looked good uh, a couple starts ago, winning out at Oaklawn Park. And then last time she finished with uh, good energy when getting second in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Yeah, and, and there are others from that Gulfstream Park Oaks uh, in this race. Uh, interesting, the you know, she's from the barn of George Weaver, but, you know, ran uh, at Oaklawn Park, ran at Gulfstream Park. Um, yeah, going to be a good price. Yeah, yeah, she'll, she'll she might be the third choice, but after Faza, I think everybody not will have pretty good odds, and and probably Merlaza is a clear second choice. So after those two, everybody will have nice odds. Sacred Wish and interesting Philly. I don't know about you, Matt, but I'm always a fan of George Weaver. When he has horses going well, uh, he keeps them going well. And George Weaver is a trainer that I've always liked. Sacred Wish there on the rail. Um, Pletcher's got a few in here, Matt. Uh, Balpool has won a couple in a row. Last one was a stakes race in New York, but it was taken off the turf on an off track. Yeah, for uh, for this is a Florida bred for trainer uh, Rob Atris. Um, and uh, before that, off the turf uh, uh, stakes win, and, and maybe Atris saw that there was a chance that that race was going to come off the turf and went in there. Um, she also won an allowance at Aqueduct. Yeah, I, I jumped the gun with Pletcher. Pletcher has uh, Miracle, a New York bred filly, and Frosty O'Toole, I believe, in here. And those are two more that we could mention. Uh, Miracle, especially a New York bred, disappointed last time in the Gazelle, but she's run a bunch of good races. Yeah, she was a debut winner at uh, at Saratoga, and that's never an easy thing to do. Uh, this uh, is a New York bred. Another one that ran in that Gulfstream Park Oaks was fifth in there. But before that, ran a nice second in the Rachel Alexandra at Fairgrounds. That's right. Comparative, another one from Brad Cox coming in with pretty good form, not as impressive looking as Merlaza. Taxed, I thought, ran a pretty good race behind wet paint 
uh, last time at Oakland Park as well. Yeah, and tax is interesting because they claimed that horse uh, for fifty thousand dollars out of a maiden claiming race, and and uh, since then had that nice second in the fantasy stakes at Oakland Park. Cats in the timber. If the fast pace materializes, she doesn't have much speed, and she's coming off a local stakes win. Yeah, in the in the Weber City uh, Miss uh, Stakes race, named after one of our favorite horses from back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I call her Weber City Miss. Weber City Miss. Either way. Yeah, Cats in the Timber. Maybe a long shot to think about underneath in your exotics. All right, that's a quick look at the Black Eyed Susan. Matt. now we got some work to do. Uh, we we uh, want to give out our top picks for these two big races. A lot of great stakes at Pimlico on Friday and Saturday. I think the Pimlico Special on Friday is a pretty interesting race. Uh, so chock full of betting opportunities. But these are the biggest two. Matt, are you ready with your top picks? I am ready. All right, here we go. I'm going to start with you. Let's do the Phillies first. They are going to run on Friday, and, and they're the Phillies. So let's do uh, your Black Eyed Susan top pick first. Sure, Brian. You know, uh, I'm just going to go back to something that you said when we were doing the, our rundown of the Black Eyed Susan, um, that you were – you were interested in finding a closer because of the way the pace was setting up, as was I. And I kind of looked through the PPs a number of times and felt the way that you said that you felt that it was just hard finding that closer that you thought could get the job done. So I kind of by default uh, ended up with uh, Bob Baffert and Faisa. All right, so Matt is on the favorite. There it is, on the favorite phase it, looking for her sixth win without a loss in the Black Eyed Susan. I'm going to try to beat her. I'm going to try to beat her with the Brad Cox Philly that I talked about. I like all four of her lifetime races. I think she's improving. I like the fact that she's won at different uh, tracks in different states. If she can take one more step forward, I think she's got a big uh, shot here. Hopefully, she doesn't get into the speed duel that we saw the pace projector talking about a little bit. So I'm going to try to beat the favorite with the probable second choice, but I think there will be nice odds after FaZe in the Black Eyed Susan. Matt, I see we're on different horses as well in the Preakness. Yeah, Brian, hey, uh, uh, Mage is the horse to beat, and 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 uh, in my eyes, probably maybe way the horse to beat. Um, I, I, I don't particularly like first mission in there. I don't particularly like uh, Blazing Sevens. I don't particularly like uh, National Treasure either. Um, I'm making uh, perform my top pick based on that uh, uh, crazy impressive victory in the Tessio, a horse that may be getting better. Um, I don't know. I, I like the horse. As I said, I think Mage is the horse to beat. But I'm going to find some ways to make that choice of mine perform, make some wagers that make sense that maybe at 15 to 1 on the morning line, this is a horse that can uh, up some prices underneath. Yeah, you got to like the 15 to 1 on the morning line, and you got to like the way perform is improving for Shugmuka, and you got to like the way he. I still don't know how he won the Federico yeah. Tessio. I'm going to have to watch that for an eighth and ninth time. I like your long shot pick, Matt, but I'm on Mage here. I think Mage has to be my top pick. I, I, it's possible after only four lifetime races running in the Kentucky Derby that uh, he'll regress. He'll have he'll have a bounce off that big performance in the Derby, but uh, everything has come back good as far as the way he bounced out of the Kentucky Derby. So I, I just think he's the best horse, and I'm picking Mage to win, but I like your long shot. So we're going to get right from our top picks, Matt, into our suggested wagers for the Preakness, and uh, we both uh, we both went different ways this time. Let's talk about your trifectas. Yeah, Brian. Uh, um, you know, we we came, decided we would come up with one wager here, and for me, I want to use that use those 15 to 1 odds on perform so i'm making a relatively small trifecta uh, part wheel here notice these are dollar trifectas not even 50 cent one trifectas 
with Mage on top and, you know, looking at the others, who is the, the horse that I think is the second most important uh, win contender. So I'm going to put first mission in there on top also with all in the field, hoping that maybe I can get a big price in there with perform in third and then switch the second and third positions uh, with mage and first mission on top. Again, two $12 trifectas, um, you know, we're not talking about likely derby style trifecta payouts just because we're in a field of uh, eight. And I will say, even though we only have one wager up here, I am probably going to do a, uh, a small uh, $2 daily double with in the Black Eyed Susan Preakness two day daily double where I will go all in the Black Eyed Susan with perform maybe just for a buck but you know if 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 the baffert horse doesn't win the the black eyed susan and somehow perform wins that will be a good payout so maybe for a buck a wheel 12 bucks on that i might take a shot there you go matt uh i i'm i'm keeping it simple here and i'm i'm going big i'm i I put down twenty dollars on this two-day daily double I think the two most likely winners on Friday are my top pick, Merlaza, and of course the heavy favorite, Beza. I, I, I think there's a good chance that one of those two will come out on top. Then I'm going to use uh, Mage, the my top pick in the dirt, uh, in the Preakness, of course. And yeah, I'm on the same horse as you. I, I think Perform is a possible possibility here as a pretty good long shot in the Preakness. So. Hopefully it won't be chalk. It won't be Faza and Mage. That'll 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 get me. Uh, I guess that'll win me a few dollars. But I'm I'm looking for something much bigger and hoping Merlaza or Perform can uh, can bring me much more money with my two day daily double. Black Eyed Susan on. Remember that's a Friday Saturday bet. The Black Eyed Susan and the Preakness. All right, there it is, Matt. Uh, before we say goodbye for uh, our last show before the Preakness, can I get a parting shot from you, my friend? Yeah, looking at looking at our wagers, I think we are kind of on the same wavelength. Uh, not all the exact same horses and the same wagers, but I think we're kind of on the same wavelength uh, uh, about uh, what we'd like to see happen uh, this weekend at Pimlico. For sure, perform, perform. Perform upsetting Mage or running second to Mage, that wouldn't be bad uh, for either one of us, uh, especially if he if he beats Mage and I get my daily double. But you you would have a daily double too, I would hope. Yes. All right, Matt, I want to thank everybody for watching. We want to thank uh, Candice Curtis too for the uh, Race Graphics Derby Wars, the best contest site out there, our sponsor. And of course, Timeform US for the pace projections. Folks, most of all, thank you. If you haven't yet subscribed, uh, if you haven't yet turned on those notifications, uh, feel free to leave us a comment. We love reading them, even if you're calling us a couple of non-skulls in the uh, in the comment section there. Uh, have a good week. Enjoy the Preakness. We'll see you back next week. And I guess we'll start talking about the Belmont soon, Matt. Yeah, three weeks.